today we have the last of our first groups. So this afternoon, I will change up the groups. I'll probably send out just a group email so you can see who your partners will be for next week. And you know, well, you don't know which problem it's going to be because it won't necessarily be. Anyway, today is the last one for Mirabal, James, Polly, and Kaylin. And they're going to do this homework problem because there are a number of people who asked about it. And I know of at least two people who did it wrong, but it gave them the right answer. So I want to make sure everybody understands how to do it the right way. So come on up, you three. Okay, I have to find my drawing. It's on a different page. I'm going to draw. I remember if I got this one right or not. No, that's wrong. So I'm just going to start with a drawing. Um, let's do it. Oh, Oh, I, I hit arrow going backwards. I keep touching something. I don't know. I have the equations. I'm just going to put up a drawing. Or 16. Oh, wait. It's different numbers. Oh, that's great. Oh, so I need someone with a calculator because the numbers are different than mine. Okay. And then if he's going backwards, I think. Oh. Angle is 24. Yes. Okay. So let's see. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's much Oh, that's a There's my problem. So I'm, I can't read my own handwriting is the problem. Um, uh, v, BG's velocity of the ball to ground, by the way. is 16. Numbers have changed. Good with that? Yeah. Okay. So, we need to find time. so can I move this? So first thing we're going to do is going to find time. And we're going to do this is the right equation. Yes, this is what yes. you have to. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's a plus. A of X. Okay. And then x of x is 0. And 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 x Like that. Okay, so that's our time for now. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna keep moving over until I run out of room. <laughs> um, what was our next step? What am I finding here? Your next is. I'm just gonna start with the equation. Oh my god, I can't read my handwriting. That's enough. Yes, that's enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
-hmm. For the record, Mira has super neat handwriting. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, we're playing for strands. <laughs> now, why are you doing this? <laughs> is the question. I can't read my own. I read up this last night to make sure I could do it, and it was brushed and not pretty. So it's zero. This is zero. Okay, what is it? Am I still right now? I'm just going to something goes wrong. Because this is what I've been. I just ran out. I pulled out a time. Yeah, you should. Pull, yeah, I pulled out a time. Yeah, okay. pull out a time. Mm -hmm. So for a second, I felt wrong. Oh, wait, this is gone. Thank you. Yeah. I, changed numbers. I changed numbers. Thank you for the reminder. Mm -hmm. That's a 24 now. This is a 24. If you can't tell, mine had 21. Okay, so that means. Plug in the numbers, then. <laughs> then it's okay. So wait, what was the original? It's sixteen instead of fifteen. Yeah. Sixteen times. <laughs> cosine. What are the angles here? Uh, cosine twenty-four. Four. Thank you. Do you have a number? And then I need you to square root it to get the. I'm just gonna. Whatever this is gonna. Fourteen point five three. That's what I got. Oh, yeah. did you have these numbers? Yeah, fourteen point five three. Okay, yes, cool. Fourteen point five three. That's what. Yeah. That's what I got. Um, there's, there's a, yep. Cool. I'm just gonna so, keep sliding over, and then now we make another table. So wall of the to the ground. Wait, that changed to 1.7. That's really bad handwriting. Oh, I totally, yeah. I totally forgot to include the rest of the equation. Thank you. Watch this. 
<laughs> oh wait, I don't. What is the sequel? My number's different because I have a twenty-one. Wait, yeah, you did the same thing I did. Fourteen times twenty-four. Yeah, guessing twenty-four. So it's That's, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thirteen. Second. Okay. And then. Where did I go? No. There it is. Um, I'll say the quarterback to ground. Zero. What is this one? We'll just keep the format. I do not have that one. Jim, can you get me the number? Thank you. So it's like five point. Oh yeah, sorry, I'm using mine. Thank you. That's gonna. Okay, that's thirteen point two seven. Thirteen point two seven. Is that not sign for cosine? No, that's cosine. I want sine. Yeah. And then just okay, that's five point nine one. Okay, for a second. And so velocity according to back initial velocity of ball to ground minus velocity of ball. All right, no, no. Ball to quarterback initial, which means it's thirteen Is it 1.9 or is it? It's 1.7 in here. 1.7 in here. Oh, yeah, they changed. They changed. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, James, can you get me that number? Thank you. Oh. I do have five minutes. Okay. That is 14.97. Which equals? 14.97? Okay. So we need this number, and so that means our triangle looks like this. Oh, that's a bad triangle. That's fine. This is, and this is our 5.9 meters squared. And we have an angle here that we need to find. And we want to find this. So, with this as our triangle now, is the square root of well, this is all squared. So I'm just going to do that. Oops. Yeah, it's 5.9. I read it. And our angle, oops, I don't know if I can actually write. Mm. Mistake at oh. the very end. So what was that mistake? Ah, oh, dang it. Wait. Oh, I used, did I use the wrong number? No, I didn't. Wait, what did I do? Not, it's not it to the oh, I flipped it. Yeah. I flipped it. That was my problem. <laughs> and so you kind of calculate, you just take the uh, 90 minus 16 by 4, 6, 1.54. That makes more sense. Isn't it? 
Okay. So you see how this was solved. Yes, I'm sorry. The I'm, I'm just making things worse. The, uh, the first thing they had to do was take the information that was given in the earth frame and calculate the initial yeah, speed just... in the earth frame. These are the and then they had to shift to the quarterback's reference frame since the quarterback was moving with respect to the earth. In the quarterback's reference frame, the ball was moving faster away from him than it was in the earth frame. And so that's why it came out that the magnitude of the speed of the ball in the horizontal direction in the earth frame was bigger by the amount that was the speed that he was traveling. And then they just used their trigonometry to put it all back together. Um, there is, I mean, that there is a very easy thing. Another thing, the only other thing that there was any issue with was, I guess you'd start here. The units there for acceleration meters per second squared, and then here as well. So good job. Yes, Emily. Um, for the test, mm -hmm. on middle you have like a sample test mm -hmm. and it has like the equations that um, you provide. Are those yeah. the ones that we yes, provide? those are the ones you'll be provided with. Yes. So you have that equation sheet. You can all look at it and prepare and know exactly where it's not many equations, so it's not going to take much orientation. But as we go further on, you'll have more equations. It's good to, to look at and know where the equations are before you come in. All right. Don't ask me why. You saw it start up, and then it just decided not to. So we are going to start a new chapter today. We're supposed to start on Wednesday. We didn't get there. The test that we have on Tuesday will not be covering the material we're starting today. It's only through what we've already covered. So you're going to be doing things that have to do with, well, make sure you're up to date on significant digits, that you know how to add and subtract in significant digits, as you know the significant figures, as well as multiplication, division, that you can identify significant figures, that you know the basic units. So real quickly, Basic unit for mass is kilogram. Basic unit for time is second. second. Basic unit for distance meters. meters. Okay. Make sure you know those. And the prefixes, you know, like K for kilo means thousand, M for milli means one one thousand. Capital M for mega means one million giga. You know, make sure you know. I'll just stay from minus nine to plus nine, from nano to giga. If you know the threes and, of course, centi, everyone needs to know centi because we use centimeters. Then we go on to make sure you understand the scientific method, right? We've been emphasizing that in the lab. And I think students are getting that because that makes lab take a lot less time when students get it. So understand the process of, you know, the scientific method starts with you actually being curious and observing something coming up with a scientifically based explanation of why it occurs. And that explanation then needs to make testable predictions that you test. And if your test confirms it, you have not proven anything correct. You've just got a little more confidence and you go back and you test again, and again, and again, and again. And if your test disproves it, then you have more information. You go back and change the hypothesis. So the hypothesis should slowly move toward more correctness. Then we just got into kinematics. So, all of your calculation problems are going to be kinematic problems. So things like this, make sure you can do them. And notice there's a range equation in the textbook. There's not a range equation on the equations you're going to be given on the exam. That's simply because the range equation, while it would have worked for this problem, won't work for your exam problems. And because the range equation is only correct if they start and stop at the same elevation. And I want to make sure people actually understand and not just, well, well, you know, here's a special equation that sometimes works. So knowledge-wise, you know, make sure you read the summaries of each chapter and you understand the summaries. And then for problems, I would just focus my problems on doing these kinematic equations problems because that's what problems are going to be on the test. All right, new material.
Newton's laws. Leslie. Wait, and also adding and subtracting vectors, is that also going to be on the exam? Uh, oh, yes. Adding and subtracting vectors will also be on the exam. Thank you. An announcement, because I always forget, Dr. Roddy will be here next week, um, Monday. And so if you're interested in going to medical school, then you're all invited to come. Actually, even if you're not interested in going to medical school, if you're interested in free pizza, you're all invited to come at 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. in KC200, where Dr. Roddy will be talking about Loma Linda University's medical school specifically and what it takes to get in. It's still valuable, even if you're not interested in going to Loma Linda. If you are applying to medical school this year, is anyone applying to medical school this year? All right, then. We won't worry about it. Okay, now we're going to talk physics. Sir Isaac Newton. I always spend so much time on him, and I can't today. Kind of interesting guy. Um, he figured out all kinds of stuff because school was canceled because of the Black Plague. Because the school was canceled, he didn't have any responsibilities, and he could just study physics. And he came up with essentially all of his great discoveries in that roughly 18 months, I think, that school was canceled, so he didn't have a job. Um, that book, this is his, his magnum opus, his masterpiece, um, Philosophy Naturalis Principia Mathematica. We just call it Principia Mathematica. I have to read the other stuff. Um, <clears throat> Natural philosophy, mainly mathematics, it, it's got all of his stuff in there. And in it, he lays out things like his laws of nature. Now, I have to start by defining what a force is. A force, besides something that is strong and loose, is anything that pushes or pulls. So if somebody kicks you in the shin, it pushed on your shin. That was a force. If you are sitting on your chair, you're pushing down on the chair, you're putting a force in the chair. It's pushing up on you. It's putting a force on you. So forces are things that act between objects that are pushing or pulling. And so we have three examples shown here. Um, our textbook likes to use W for weight. Weight is a force. I use F of the subscript of G for force of gravity. Force of friction, this used R, I use F. Force normal, I'll talk about what normal means in a minute. But those are different forces, things that are pushing on this block. So let's talk about the fundamental forces, the basic forces. There are four fundamental forces, only four. Everything that's a force that acts on you, me, or anything else is one of these four. So the first one, gravity. Gravity is a fundamental force that acts between any two objects with mass. Mass is matter. Technically, I think I told you before, there's two types of mass. There's gravitational mass and inertial mass. We're going to talk about both of those today. This is, gravity is depending on the gravitational mass. And so any two things with mass, me and this thing, there is a force between us that's attracting us. Gravity is always attractive. The force between me and that thing is very small. I can't feel it. But because the Earth is so big in mass, I can feel the force of gravity between me and the Earth. And so we define down as the direction that force of gravity is acting on me. Next one, the weak nuclear force. These are, by the way, in order of strength from weakest to strongest, if you are at the right distances. The weak nuclear force is a force that only is exhibited inside the nucleus of an atom. It's a very short range force. It's a force we will not talk about at all after today until the end of second semester. And even then, it will be just to say that it exists. Third, the electromagnetic force. Trust went forward, yes. The electromagnetic force is the force between charged particles. Mass is the gravitational charge. Electric charge, we just call charge, is the equivalent to mass, but for the electromagnetic force. Fundamental difference, though, gravitational force is always attractive. The electromagnetic force can be either attractive or repulsive. So it can be two directions. Why? Well, there's only one type of mass. Everybody here has positive mass. There are two types of electric charge, positive and negative. 
Strong nuclear force, the strongest of the forces, once again, only acts at very short ranges, so only significant inside the nucleus of atoms. We won't talk about it, except for the same time we talk about the weak nuclear force, and in the same way. We won't try and distinguish them. So those are the four fundamental forces. Every force that we feel is one of those. I specified gravity already. The Earth is applying a gravitational force down on me, pulling me down. Every other force I experience is electromagnetic. So, types of common forces, contact forces. Contact, as it implies, things touching. So if I come and I touch Nathan, I will put a force on him. If I'm like here, I can't put a force on him. Up until Newton, they kind of thought that was the only kind of force there was. That it was, things had to touch for there to be a force applied. Then we have weight and gravity. That's what Newton realized with his apple, as you'll see in the next slide, should I ever get there, that gravity can act at a distance. Weight is a term for the force of gravity acting on it. So that's why I have weight slash gravity. Then we have the normal force. Normal is a mathematical word that means the direction that is perpendicular to any line you can draw on a surface. So the floor here, I can draw lines in all kinds of directions. And there's only one direction that's perpendicular to all of those lines that's coming out. And so we call that direction the normal direction. So a lot of people say perpendicular is the same as normal. Perpendicular is between two lines. That's perpendicular. Normal is between a plane and a line. So this is normal to that surface. What direction is normal to this surface? Coming straight out. So normal is coming out of the surface in the direction that is normal to the surface. That's why we call it normal. It's not normal as in the standard. It's normal as a specific meaning. Tension. Tension is force distributed through something like a string or a cable. So it's a force that's being distributed through something. <coughs> Springs have their own force equation, so I'll talk about that in a minute. Friction, there's two kinds of friction. Static friction, friction when something's not sliding. If I take... Well, let's come up here so everyone can see. If I take and push in this light, I push on a little bit, it's not sliding. Why? Because static friction, stationary static, is keeping it from sliding. If I push hard enough, it will slide, but there's still friction that's opposing my hand, so if I stop, it stops. We call that kinetic friction. So friction when the two surfaces are sliding against each other is kinetic friction. We'll learn more about that coming up. Air resistance, first one I learned about as a kid because we'd be driving to school and I'd have my hand out the window, playing at the air and noticing, wow, there's a whole lot more force pushing back. I didn't know the word force. When my hand's like this, then when it's like this. Air resistance, you notice that snow speed a lot. Buoyancy, lift, and fluid pressure, all of those are things that are associated with fluids. So I put them together. They're not the same force, but they're associated with fluids. And we'll learn more about those when we get to fluids. Oh, I have Newton's laws, and I have the picture of Newton. So Newton's three laws, super, super important for physics. The first one is known as the law of inertia. The first law says that an object in motion stays in motion unless a net force acts on it. Net. Net means the sum of. You add them all together. So net force means sum of the force. That one there I wrote, I think I quoted this from the textbook, an unbalanced force acts on it. An unbalanced net force, the force acts on it. Number two, well, let, let's focus on what that means. If we were to go back to Aristotle, Aristotle said, if I take this pastry and I slide it on the desk, it's going to stop. Why? Because it's natural for it to be stopped. That's its natural motion. And I did an unnatural thing. I committed a violence to make it move against its will. And when I stopped pushing on it, then it went to its natural form of being at rest. That's what Aristotle believed. And it was Newton that said, 
I don't think so. I think that this sweet roll should just keep going on forever unless something makes it stop. And so he said there had to be a force that was as on this to make it stop. What do we call that force? Friction. Yes. And so Aristotle basically didn't have a friction idea. He thought it was just natural for it to stop. Likewise, he thought if I take this up here and drop it, it will fall down because its natural position is sitting on the ground. He, he said that's why they fall. And once again, Newton said, I don't think so. I think something's making it fall. Something is putting a force on it. The second law puts an equation to the idea you had in the first law. The first law said things will stay in constant motion. That means constant velocity. Direction and speed will stay constant unless something acts on them. The second one says that the acceleration an object feels is equal to the sum of all of the forces acting on it divided by the mass of the object. Now, this is a very famous equation. You often see this written. Please work. You often see it written like that. And it's something that makes me cringe every time I see it like that. That is not correct. Leslie, why is it incorrect? Because it's not like one force. It's like the sum of all the forces. It needs to have the sum of the forces. It's not just one force. I'm standing here right now. Gravity's acting on me, pushing me down, but I'm not accelerating. And so I can't just say, ah, there must be no force of gravity because he's not accelerating. It's the net force on me has to be zero because I'm not accelerating. And notice it's the sum of the forces on an object is equal to, well, look at this. Better this way. Back when I used to use markers, I once marked on the screen. I was you know, not thinking. <laughs> sum of the forces on an object is equal to the mass of that said object times the acceleration of that object. Right, so this equation is all applying to one object. Then the third law, there's a song about this. Well, no, not exactly. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. That's Newton's third law. You guys probably all heard that, right? In that statement, action means force. Reaction means a returning force. So what that says is if I punch the wall, I am going to put a force on the wall. And Newton's third law says that wall is going to put a force back on my hand that is equal in strength to the force I put on the wall, but in the opposite direction. So putting this in a very simple way, a few years ago, we saw it, a few years ago, it was actually before I came to um, We were sitting in Baker's, Bakersfield? Yeah, not Bakersfield, yeah. Fresno. We were seeing Fresno stoplight waiting for traffic, and you want to go eat some pizza. And this guy walked across the highway, got hit by a car. Blew up in the air, hit the ground, he was dead. It was very traumatic. What was harder, the force that that was actually the pickup put on him or the force he put on the pickup? They're the same. So many times we tend to think, well, I mean, look, it threw him up in the air, <laughs> killed him. That must have been a really big force. Whereas the car just had a little dent, probably. We didn't go down to pick up. But the forces were exactly equal according to Newton's third law, just opposite directions. The human body is not nearly as strong as the frame of that truck, and so the damage done to the human body was much bigger than the damage done to the truck. But the damage is not a measurement of how big the force is. So those are the three laws. Notice here I have Newton's third law written as a vector equation. Vector signs mean has direction. The minus sign here means that the directions are opposite. The subscripts, force of one on two and force of two on one. So if one is James and two is Kalen, then this would be force of James on Kalen is equal to minus the force of Kalen on James. James. So does that mean, um if you're falling to the earth, um, is the earth technically being pushed up in the same, I mean, not like, definitely not displacement, but 
Like if you're falling, is the earth being pushed up to the same now, degree? The, the answer is yes. There's a couple ideas being conflated here, but the answer is still yes. The force of gravity is pulling you to the earth and pulling the earth to you. And so when I jump up, when I was jumping, I was pushing down on the earth with my feet. The earth was pushing up against that. And as a result, I accelerated upward. The earth had to accelerate downward. But the mass of the earth is so large that its downward acceleration is minuscule. The velocity it achieved going down was minuscule. As I was coming down, the earth was coming back up to me. But if you were to try to measure the motion of the earth, you'd have to have really sensitive you know, devices to measure that. Whereas my motion is much easier because I have a much smaller mass. Same idea, you know, if a BB is shot at a bowling ball, the BB bounces off the bowling ball, the bowling ball does react. It's just so much more massive that it's a very small reaction. Free body diagrams. We're now going to focus on Newton's second law. That's the focus. Newton's third law, you have to know. You have to be able to use it. You use it in conjunction with forces. Newton's second law, though, is really big because it relates acceleration to force. So with Newton's second law, we had sum of the forces on an object is equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration of the object. So in this picture, we have two young ladies pushing on a third one. The two red ladies are pressing on the blue lady. Clothing wise. And so that lady has two horizontal forces. Now, this picture is only looking at the horizontal plane. There's going to be gravitational, you know, vertical forces as well. So we have those two forces. And if we're going to apply Newton's second law, we do the sum of the forces, mass and acceleration. And so we show all of the forces acting on the object. So over here, this lady in blue becomes the dot. That's the object that I'm interested in. And then it shows arrows for each of the forces that are acting on her. We call that a free body diagram. It's a diagram of the forces acting on the object that I'm interested in. And the object I'm interested in is just written as a dot, as a free body. Those are very useful because when we apply Newton's second law, we look at this picture and we say, oh, what is the net force? Well, I've got this one to the right, this one up. You would add them as vectors, which means that I would... Go like that to add them. And then to find the resultant, it's going to go from the starting point to the ending point. So there's my net force vector. So we use these free body diagrams to get our net force, to identify all the forces so we can get it for applying the second law. Quickly going through the three forces, contact forces, things that are touching. Here we have a picture of Two people pushing on a boy in a little wheelbarrow. Or not wheelbarrow. As you get older, you lose vocabulary. Or you go see now. Something like that. Yes, a, a wagon. And so it's showing here all the forces. And now it's showing all of them. So we have all of the forces. Now it's not showing forces acting on the pushers. Only on the wagon. Because the object we're interested in is the wagon. And so on the wagon, oops, wrong way. On the wagon, we have the force of friction. We have the force of this girl pushing, the force of this girl pushing, the force of gravity, the weight down, and the normal force pushing up. So all those forces are shown in the picture, and then it's summarized here in the free body diagram. Now it's kind of interesting to me. They show the weight and the normal as two separate forces acting on the dot, and they show the force two and force one is one added to the other already with force of friction not added to it. I really don't care. Just make sure on a free body diagram you show all the forces acting on it. You'll probably, on not the test next week, but the one after that, have pictures and you'll have to say, this one's the correct free body diagram. So make sure you have all the forces acting in the proper directions. Okay, gravitational force. I've got to hide this so you can see. Gravitational force, as long as you're on the surface of the Earth, force of gravity is your mass, or the mass of the object you're interested in, times g, where g is the number you've already learned, 9.80 meters per second squared. That will be, that part two will be on your test too. 
Newton's apple. Newton's apple is famous because this is the illustration, probably not a true story. If it is a true story, there's still lots of falsehood because if you go to England, one of my colleagues went there and he went to Oxford and they said, here's the tree that Newton was sitting under. And then he went to Newton's grandmother's house and they said, here's the tree Newton was sitting under. If either one of those were true, it would be the one at his grandmother's house, but probably he was never sitting under a tree to begin with. The whole point of Newton's apple is that gravity is acting at a distance. When that apple is in the air between the tree and the ground, something's pulling it down. And so Newton said, hey, a force can act at a distance. And so this is the actual equation for the force of gravity. It's a constant G times the mass of one object times the mass of the other divided by the separation squared. But if you're on the surface of the Earth, the mass of one object is the mass of the Earth. And the separation between you on the surface of the Earth and the center of the Earth is the radius of the Earth. And so we take this equation, we say g times the mass of the Earth times the race of the or divided by the race of the Earth squared. We'll just call that the constant lowercase g, which it turns out if you calculate is 9.80 meters per second squared. I'm actually going to skip over the spring today so we can get to our problem. Here's our problem. A 10 kilogram crate is sliding on the floor at a constant rate of 2 meters per second due to an applied force of 1.25 newtons. So this 1.25 newtons is the same direction that it's traveling. What will happen if the applied force is doubled to 2.50 newtons at time equals zero? So find the speed and acceleration as a function of time. If at time equals zero, the force is doubled from 1.25 newtons to 2.50 newtons. This is your last chance to get that plus one point with this team before we break up the teams. So remember, raise your hand when your team has answers. Remember I told you before, unless it's mentioned, don't include friction. Well, here we know that if it's going at a constant rate, what's the net force at a constant rate? <laughs> you can use either Newton's first law or second law. The first law says that it has constant motion unless there's an unbalanced force. So since this has constant motion, the net force has to be zero. Or you could have used Newton's second law to say the acceleration is equal to net force over the mass. Since the acceleration is zero, it's constant speed, then it must have a net force of zero. So you know that with the applied force of 1.25 newtons, the net force is zero. Now, when you think you have both answers, raise your hand. You want the speed, like, then what would you want? As a function of time. Do you have uh, any question for me?
This is the two-meter description. The description of it. So this is the power. And if you're going to go for the same time, so there's five times the time to the acceleration. Okay. I will adjust the acceleration. It looks like those. Does anybody have it? You only have a couple of minutes, so I will. Do, do you have it? No. Okay, then I will go over it because this is the kind of thing that, that A, students did really poorly on on the pretest, and that B is super important for us to understand. So we have this, if I draw a free body diagram, I should have made a blank page here, but I didn't, so I have to go to. If we look at the free body diagram, initially, here's the object. There's the force applied, and there's the force of friction. Acceleration is equal to zero because it says constant speed. So I can take this and say sum of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration equals zero. So force applied. Force applied is in the positive direction. Force of friction is in the negative direction. So I put a minus sign because of the direction of the arrow. And I can solve for the force of friction. Now that I know the force of friction, now I go to my second scenario. Force of friction remains the same. And I have my speed initial is 2.00 meters per second because that's the speed it was going before I doubled the speed, or the, the force. So now applying Newton's second law, the acceleration is equal to sum of the forces over mass. Looking at my picture, that's going to be the force applied minus the force of friction over the mass, or 2.50 Newtons minus 1.25 Newtons, all over 10 kilograms. 
So my acceleration is equal to 0 0.125 meters per second squared. There's one of my answers. The other answer is speed is equal to speed initial plus AT equals 2.00 meters per second plus 0 0.125 meters per second squared T. There's the other answer. Question. So then you said that sometimes if it doesn't mention friction, then we shouldn't worry about it. But right. in this case, was it because of the wording of what it said? In this case, you actually knew you had to include friction because with an applied force, it had no acceleration. If there's no acceleration with applied force, you know that there's something opposing that force that's equal and opposite. But if the acceleration was given, then you would know that. If there was an acceleration, I could go and calculate and see if there's friction or not. But but here, you knew the acceleration was zero. You knew it had to have friction. So that's, that's a case where it was implied that there's friction, even though it never said the word friction. Emily. Well, this is as a function of time. So this is at any time. If I put in time zero, I'm going to get the two meters per second. If I put in two seconds later, I'm going to get five meters per second. So at any time, this gives me the correct speed. There is no number time that we plug in. Right? It's as a function of time. So it has time as a variable. All right. Have a great weekend. I'll see you on Monday.